Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today for our session to accelerate the GovCloud with FSX for NetApp ONTAP. Uh, and thanks to Michael and uh, Sean, who are going to join us as well for some Q&A in a little bit. So I thought we would start off today with about a 15 or 20 minute overview or introduction to what is FSX for NetApp on tap. Um, we'll go spend that, that 15 or 20 minutes, go through some examples, how it works, what are the benefits and what's the value. And then we've got five or six really good questions for the AWS team joining us here. And we'll go through it and talk those questions with Michael uh, and Sean to cover that in a minute. Okay, all right, well, let's hop right in. So uh, first off, just talking about NetApp and AWS, we have had a really strong partnership for over 10 years now. Um, it actually started back in 2011 or 2012 when we created our first version of Cloud Volumes on tap. And that has grown through a variety of other services and capabilities that we've added in. And we'll talk about some of those services today, but you can see how they came up, things around backup and recovery, things like Cloud Sync in 2016, uh, new types of cloud volume services spinning up in, in 2018, um, Cloud Insights, one of our services around optimization and cost savings and so on, even cloud tiering, <clears throat> excuse me, and how do you tier out uh, blocks of data to lower cost mediums to save costs and do that in an automated fashion. Uh, cloud tiering that's built in for a couple of years now in the cloud, all the way up to the latest service, which was announced a year ago, August now, it's been uh, Amazon FSX for NetApp on tap. So let's hop right in. If you talk to a lot of the industry analysts or federal agencies out there today, there's a lot of challenges around data and cloud and, and how do I manage that infrastructure wherever it might be. And right now, 68% of the CIOs out there are driven by industry and the nature of their business or that federal agency. How do I get my data to cloud? Are there federal mandates? Are there requirements of which a lot, a lot of them are in place to drive them to cloud? The challenge around that is some of the applications and the data are stuck on premise due to the way they're developed, the way that they're managed, the infrastructure they use, and they have a hard time trying to migrate that to cloud. And there are some of these mandates, one of which you see on the right called cloud first. Um, that was a mandate a few years ago that said the government agencies should try to put all applications and data in the cloud. The challenge is it, it drove them to do things in a forced way and it wasn't natural. Um, it didn't give them time to refactor the applications in cloud or they had to lift and shift and they didn't always recognize the savings or the benefits there. And then that cloud first has now changed to cloud smart, which is let's put in cloud what makes sense, where it works good and it's cost effective. So that's still there. And a lot of these agencies are still challenged with how do I get it there and, and still run my mission right effectively. So NetApp in working with AWS have developed our data fabric framework or architecture. Uh, the nice thing about the NetApp data fabric is it will enable you to have your data in any location uh, for any user and yet maintain performance, high availability and security around that. So you can see some examples here of on-premise, it could be a private cloud, it could be a core site or a hybrid site, and you see the AWS cloud, and then you also see some of the other capabilities that AWS has, like outposts, right? Which are their remote cloud uh, units capabilities, if you will, that are running in a cabinet somewhere in another data center, but yet give you all of the AWS benefits. So that data fabric from NetApp using things like our Snap Mirror replication, which is our intelligent, block-based, four kilobyte, very granular, intelligent way to send data fast and effectively and efficiently is now running in AWS, in FSx for NetApp on tap. It's running on premise for the NetApp customers there. So we are jointly helping NetApp customers or any customers get into the cloud using things like Snap Mirror and also our Cloud Sync, which is another way to move any file or object data 
um, from one location to another. And this gives you those efficiencies, a unified platform, and a seamless way to run those missions in the cloud while giving you the data protection you need. So introducing FSx for NetApp on tap. Amazon spent about a year and a half taking our data on tap uh, operating system and incorporating and developing it into their cloud. It is running as a native service in the Amazon cloud. Okay, so they own it, operate it, and run it. You buy it through through them, and it gives you all the benefits that you may have had with NetApp on-prem, including that data fabric and the intelligence, right? You can also deploy FSx for NetApp, otherwise known as FSx in, with our cloud manager tool from NetApp. So you can go to cloud.netapp.com and spin up cloud manager and deploy it and manage it there. But the good news is it's a native service and gives you all of the efficiencies and intelligence that you need to run file and block storage in the AWS clouds. If you take a look at what it might look like, this is a representation of what could be FSXN or it could be our cloud volumes on tap. So FSXN is that first party consumption service that you buy natively from Amazon, it gives you the file and block and the replication and the efficiency and security. CVO happens to be a software based version you can install on a virtual machine in the cloud kind of like infrastructure as a service. And the reason CVO is there is some customers like to manage things on their own. But both of them do which see, perform rather what you see depicted here. So they have deduplication, compression, compaction, and tiering of data to save costs. They might run in this case on an EC2 instance using some EBS storage and tiering out to S3. The good news is they give you all of the native protocols out there for NFS, iSCSI, and SIFS, and all versions of those as well. Um, so you get full features for file and block. You get the cost savings. Everything can be encrypted, and by default is with AES-256 encryption. And then you can replicate that data from on-prem up to the cloud, hybrid back and forth, as you see with the SnapMirror protocol. So this helps any NetApp existing customers easily lift and shift and migrate to Amazon, or if they need to represent some of their data back on premise, they can do that. It's open both ways, okay? And CVO is running in commercial cloud and gov cloud, and CVO is also in the uh, C2S Intel cloud and in some IL-5 and IL-6 environments. The FSXN is going through FedRAMP process right now uh, and hopefully will be uh, done with FedRAMP in the near future. And in the meantime, you can use CVO today because it doesn't need FedRAMP, okay? It's a software you're running in your cloud. It'll be installed and pick up the security boundaries in your cloud. So you could start with CVO today if you require FedRAMP and then easily snap mirror and convert over to FSXN at any time later, okay? And then Fed, FSXN is running in commercial cloud and gov cloud in a variety of places. So the value of FSXN is it's a fully managed service. It's always on, right? High availability. It's very performant because you can pick the different classes of performance you need, and it can run a variety of use cases from file shares to enterprise grade needs. It's already optimized with that dedupe compression, compaction, and tiering to save costs, and it's going to be very fast and flexible in the cloud. And some of the capabilities it brings are the agile and scalability. You can start small and grow it dynamically on the fly. It can be highly available and it is built by design to do that and be very durable. It brings in that data protection. So NetApp has the unique snapshot capability, which are pointer based copies of data. And you can recover data <clears throat> from one or multiple locations in seconds, as opposed to waiting hours to get something back. It's also going to give you the security and compliance features as we touched on earlier built in. Things like AES-256 encryption by default, et cetera. It 
it does support a variety of use cases. So you could do file shares, you could do data protection, backup and recovery. You can run enterprise applications on it as well. Um, you can do analytics. One of the things that we're doing with FSXN, and this was just announced at VMware Explorer, or VM Explorer they call it now, um, is the VMware NetApp AWS partnership where we're now supported for full data store support in the cloud with VMC, which is VMware's cloud in AWS, right? And we'll bring that efficiency and cost savings as well. So there's another use case that helps customers if you're running VMware natively replicate up to the cloud and do 100% lift and shift DR coop failover to FSXN with NetApp in the cloud if you're doing VMware. All right, touching on cyber and ransomware, there's a variety of topics out there these days. A lot of the government agencies are uh, mandated or required by NIST or OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, to have things like FIPS or common criteria, different certifications. You get these certifications or a lot of them built in with FSXN and you get these capabilities around that cyber ransomware protection. So you have the ability to protect with our snapshots and backup and recovery. You can also detect when data is changing with the tools that are built into ONTAP and FSXN. And you have an easy way to just drag and drop files or data and recover from snapshots or replica copies done with SnapMirror or SnapVault. What it might look like is something like this, where you see a cloud environment and you could have CVO depicted with the, the green on tap number nine there, and nine happens to be the version of data on tap. And then, or it could be the FSXN, which is the managed consumption service for data on tap, both available in AWS. And that's going to give you that intelligence. It's going to leverage the best computing, storage resources, the efficiency, the security, the protection, and it'll talk to all of the other services out there in AWS and give your users and applications the best of breed technology to run and access their data. You could connect this cloud to an on-prem as you see in another data center and easily replicate the data back and forth with SnapMirror. You could also be running this in commercial cloud or gov cloud as you see here and then CVO itself is actually in C2S on the upper left. And remember, FSXN is actually going through the FedRAMP authorization, and we, we hope to have that done in the coming few months, okay? Oh, and lastly, the applications. Once you put this data fabric architecture in place, you're free to put any enterprise application or cloud native application and its data on top of that. And you see just a few here listed at the top and uh, you, it's, it's open. Any file or block storage can run on this infrastructure that needs it. Okay, cloud backup service is another service that NetApp has around backing up on tap volumes. It can look at any on tap volume in the cloud and even on premise, and it backs up to an object target. So you see here, cloud backup could give you that second redundant separate copy of data to recover from a cyber or ransomware attack or an accidental deletion or a disaster, that kind of a thing. And that backup target could be AWS S3. It could also be something like our storage grid object storage if you happen to be on premise running cloud backup service. But it gives you a single pane of glass, a menu driven interface to do essentially a level zero backup and then incrementals forever. And you can back up and recover and find and search files and directories you want to restore right in the cloud backup service interface. Again, think in cyber ransomware recovery, great tool. Cloud Insights is another service we have around infrastructure optimization. It effectively can look at your compute and your data in any environment, and that could use NetApp or not use NetApp, and it's cloud aware and it's on-prem aware. And effectively, it'll help you realize where your virtual machine usage is, it'll give you guidelines on what might need more performance, more memory, what 
you might be able to convert from five large machines to five mediums and save, on average, customers save 30 or 40% alone using Cloud Insights. It'll also look at your data elements, right? That could be on NetApp or not on NetApp and figure out your trending, your usage, when you need to add capacity and find unused capacity so you don't have to purchase more resources when you shouldn't. And it's got a lot of reporting capabilities to really figure out chargeback, cost accounting, things like that. So Cloud Insights, a great infrastructure optimization service around compute and data can help customers save 30% or more on average. All right, so Cloud Data Sense is a, a different type of a service NetApp has. It is a governance and compliance service. And Cloud Data Sense will actually run in cloud. It can look at any data anywhere in cloud, even on premise if you connect it. And it will summarize what you have around uh, legal concerns like PCI, HIPAA, SEC, GDPR, CCPA, the things you see here. And it'll summarize what's sensitive, what might need to be protected, what, what you might need to delete if it's considered toxic because you don't want to be responsible for data after a year or seven years, right? And you can give it custom search patterns like social security numbers or IRS or things to look for. And it'll look at any data, file, object, even database data. And that can be on NetApp or non-NetApp. So Cloud Data Sense is a fantastic tool to figure out first what you have, and then you can figure out how to protect that data no matter where it lives. Um, and it's available today in a variety of locations. Again, great analyzation tool around governance and compliance to figure out what you need to secure. So one of our uh, DOD customers is actually using FSx for NetApp ONTAP. And they had some issues around backing up data and trying to meet their timeframes, their cost concerns, their SLEs, if you will, around backing up that data. Uh, they chose to use FSXN, uh, have deployed that a few weeks back now, and they're already starting to see the benefits. It has allowed them to use the dedupe compression and compaction and tearing out the object, like S3 is what it would do in AWS and effectively has helped them meet their SLAs and hit their cost constraints, okay? And security is built in. It's all encrypted at REST, AES-256. So that secures that. And they happen to be using Snap Mirror, a replication protocol, I think from on-prem to the cloud. And that itself is encrypted usually with TLS, which is AES-256 as well. OK, so the outcome is it helped them solve their backup and recovery issues. It gives them a full set of the data available in the cloud. They can fail over to the cloud if they want, or they can fire up their applications in the cloud and access the data natively because it's running on FSx for NetApp on tap, just like it would with an array on premise. So it gives you the best of both worlds um, and, and just solves those problems for you. OK. All right, well, that's what I had for the presentation content. And let me stop sharing. And then we'll bring on Michael and Sean, if you're there, and we'll have a couple of questions and answers. Here we go. Hey, Michael, how you doing today? I'm doing good, Jim. How are you? Great. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining. Hey, Jim. Great. You guys want to state your roles again for us? Uh, certainly. So uh, Sean and I are part of at AWS, the worldwide public sector team focusing. I am a partner account manager supporting NetApp. Uh, and I am a senior solutions architect in the public sector sector. So Michael and I work together to support public sector customers as well as partners. Great. Thank you guys for coming today. Um, exciting information here. I know you guys are really excited and NetApp is both around FSXN, it's really going to help our joint customers accomplish a lot uh, of their data management needs they have today. So um, by the way, let's just let's just go through a couple of questions and um, you guys can let me know what your thoughts are around some of these. So the first question would be, 
What do you guys think are some of the unique challenges that our DOD customers are facing these days? So what makes uh, a DOD customer a little different than, uh, you know, your average commercial customer or even other public sector customers is, is really their uh, diversity. So, you know, a certain portion of what they do, core IT services, is probably very similar to um, what you would see uh, in other uh, large IT organizations. But then they span uh, these very diverse environments uh, within the U.S., outside the U.S., um, even at a, a tactical edge where there's no kind of formal uh, data center type environment. Um, and they need to be able to operate uh, quickly, uh, efficiently, and, and securely. Um, so while, you know, if you look at any individual AWS customer, you know, whether it's industrial or whether it's in tech, you know, they, they have a kind of core set of use cases that they they focus around. With, with DOD, you really see that, that huge uh, spectrum of, you know, almost, it almost looks like uh, a, a bunch of different uh, AWS customers all, all rolled into, into one. Um, and so that ends up being a, a good thing because, um, you know, the AWS cloud was built uh, to serve a, a wide and diverse uh, market of customers. So, you know, whether that's, you know, the uh, Netflix of the world or whether that's uh, local governments even uh, here or, or globally. Um, and so you have this infrastructure that's been built up uh, and can support that that wide variety that a DoD customer can can take advantage of. So that deployment footprint is already there globally. The the AWS regions are already operating uh, throughout the world and throughout the U.S. Um, and so the the DoD doesn't have to um, you know do everything completely uh, bespoke you know from the ground up um, you know digging digging the space for, for new data centers and, and power and cooling. Um, they can take advantage of what's there. And, you know, we've even seen some significant changes in strategy from the, the DOD CIO's office um, talking about uh, a goal to get to a predominantly zero trust environment by 2027 uh, and even providing guidance and strategy around the uh, outside the U.S. or OCONUS uh, use of cloud adoption. Um, so bundle that all together, um, you know, when, when a customer tries to do all of that themselves, uh, they're going through a very large effort to cover a very diverse range of use cases. Uh, it's, it's expensive, it requires a lot of talent and, and manpower, um, but if they're able to make use of services and capabilities that are already there, uh, then they're saving themselves a ton of time in reaching that goal. Uh, and they're also somewhat uh, future-proofing themselves in the sense that um, you know, if you look at the portfolio of what they may have today, you know, they may have systems that have been designed, you know, even 10, 20 years ago. Uh, trying to upgrade those today is, is much more challenging. So if you have a partner that is continuing uh, to upgrade uh, their infrastructure and upgrade their software and capabilities, um, then you're able to take advantage of that as opposed to having to do all that work yourself. Excellent. Very good. Uh, great, great point, Sean. Take advantage of what's there in place and, and leverage that breadth of coverage. Again, back to the data fabric point, I think AWS has that mastered as far as locations and, and availability, given the customer and the agency and the mission, the best choice of where to run and what they need to do. Uh, so I think that's great. Michael, did you have any thoughts on that question? What are some of the unique challenges that DOD customers face? I think the you know, one of the challenges that they're they're facing is not just a, you know from a security perspective, but is the time in which it takes to do everything, and that leads into some of if they're already using NetApp on-prem, being able to leverage solutions like SnapMirror that already they are already leveraging. They may be doing replication on-prem to on-prem. Now it's just pointing that target to FSXN. Uh, or cloud volumes on tap, depending on the use case or what cloud they want to use within a region within AWS. Um, I also think that when you start looking at uh, where VMware is, they're leveraging VMware today. So VMware 
cloud on AWS or VMC is another option to be able to do a list and shift in that fashion. And so you're looking at two solutions in that area that can help speed up the migration to cloud. And so you're not having to look at, um, in many cases, uh, you know, months and years, doing it in, in days and weeks. Great point. Great point. Yeah, um, I think the VMware is is a really important point too, because a lot of the agencies and customers are running VMware in a, a lot of environments, uh, and this now gives them the easy button, if you will, to continue getting the best of VMware in the cloud, right, and maintain their functionality and what they're doing. And due to FSXN, they can actually save twenty or thirty percent of their cost of running in the cloud. So. Um, that's a great example. I'm glad you re-mentioned that, Michael, uh, as well. So, okay. Uh, next question, guys. How do AWS and NetApp help? And I'll let either one of you guys go first, whoever would choose. So we we talked about this di diversity and complexity challenge um, because of the different types of workloads, the, the age of those workloads, the, the places that they want them to be run. Um, and so when you have this kind of global footprint of infrastructure and you have a software or, or storage layer that has consistent features and capabilities in a variety of locations, so whether that's in AWS, whether that's running in your own data center, uh, whether that's you know running at a tactical edge, um, that becomes extremely helpful, right? Because then you can centrally plan, build and design uh, you know, secure and efficient uh, architectures that you can then apply in a number of places. Whereas uh, traditionally, when you don't have that consistency, when you don't have, you know, that that platform to to kind of build everything on uh, globally, um, you then end up having to re-engineer for each one of those locations, each one of those use cases. And so you get this a uh, high range of uh, diversity. It's much harder to track and maintain uh, that things are in compliance, that are secure, um, that they're protected to the same degree that they would be uh, at another location. Um, and so when you're able to uh, apply uh, infrastructure as code, you know, have those consistent configurations, uh, it allows you to, you know, uh, centralize that talent uh, make sure that the best practices and best standards are, standards are being, being put forward uh, and that teams in other areas are easily able to apply those standards. So if the code is applying a lot of the configuration and making sure everything is consistent, then there's less room uh, for human error. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Michael, any thoughts of you on some of the unique DoD challenges? I think Sean hit them pretty good. Uh, I know the tactical edge is a huge conversation that we're starting to see more and more of and really getting into art of the possible of how do we support the DOD initiatives at the edge and bringing the data back where it can be analyzed in, in data centers. So I think, you know, highlighting that functionality and, and I recommend that when people are, are looking at that, reach out to NetApp and AWS to have more of an in-depth conversation as to what can be done. There's a lot of possibility there that we just don't have time to go into at the moment. Yeah, so when you look at, um, for example, a, a US presence, um, replication technology like SnapMirror is, is extremely efficient. So then you're able to replicate at scale, you know, across the country. So east, east and west of the country. Um, as you start uh, moving outside that boundary, um, your bandwidth becomes less predictable. And so where you can, you want that very efficient replication technology to be there uh, to minimize your bandwidth usage. Um, but where you can't, um, you also want the ability to support offline transfers. Um, and so, so that's something that AWS uh, and NetApp uh, support together. If you need to move data uh, from one location uh, back to one of our uh, AWS cloud regions, uh, we can provide that that offline support uh, to get data back. Perfect, perfect. Um, I, I think you guys might have mentioned security, but in those unique DoD challenge areas, 
What do you all see on the AWS side around around security related to these topics? Uh, so cybersecurity has been uh, a huge concern, uh, really for all of our customers, but especially for um, our security conscious uh, customers. Um, and so they all have uh, different uh, risks. So for some agencies, you know, the risk of ransomware and, and shutting down operations is is one of the uh, stronger risks that we need to help them protect against. Whereas others, um, it's more about the potential exfiltration or, or you know, espionage factor of, of getting access to data and then pulling that out without, you know, necessarily leaving a, leaving a mark. <clears throat> um, so the way we try to address that is uh, through uh, those consistent set of security controls. So you can design uh, that environment to align with, for example, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, you can rely on best practices that have been published that, that align with those key pillars um, and easily deploy that across a, a wide range of teams with, with varying skill sets. Uh, so for example, um, Anomaly detection is something supported both by NetApp and by AWS. So while NetApp uh, has some built-in anomaly detection uh, detection uh, within their uh, storage software, AWS can also add an extra layer on top of that with something like uh, Guard Duty, which would um, detect anomalies at the network level. And so if you had, you know, suddenly uh, data, for example, being uh, moved in mass to uh, you know an IP in a, a uh, non-friendly country, um, you know things like that would be detected and alerted. Um, you could build automated uh, remediation actions that would help shut that down and and minimize the damage. In addition to that, um, probably the most common piece that we see is really just um, getting things to a place where they're backed up. Uh, they're immutable, and there's some where, way that you can recover that. And so if you have an on-prem presence of NetApp or other storage devices, uh, getting that into cloud, uh, locking that into uh, immutable storage, uh, and then being able to restore that in the event of you know, some form of attack is um, you know, a huge uh, safety layer and, and relatively easy to execute. Sean, real quick, a little little off topic question, but in your in your opinion, maybe for the audience, the immutable backup uh, part, how how does that work, and, and why why is that important? If you could share, at a high level at least. Gotcha. So, um, in particular, in the case of of things like a, a ransomware event, um, you know, one of the targets is not just the primary data, but the backups of the data, because uh, criminals now know that. Um, you know, if they if they take out the primary data, but you have a backup that you can restore, then you know they're probably not going to get their payday. Um, <clears throat> and so the the backups get targeted, and uh, oftentimes the mechanisms that they use to compromise your primary storage, you know, whether that was vulnerabilities within servers and whether that was actually getting some sort of uh, privilege escalation. So let's say they were able to get some sort of administrative credentials out of the memory of one of your uh, machines and then use that to further attacks on other machines that let's say had the backups. Um, by creating a, a, an entirely separate uh, control and authentication plane, uh, something that works different than the rest of your environment, then you are improving that uh, security posture so that whatever mechanism they use to uh, corrupt and um, you know, attack your your primary infrastructure. They're not going to be able to simply just copy and paste that over to uh, your backup infrastructure. So if you're storing data in cloud, um, you're using different credential mechanisms to manage that. It's a completely different uh, security control plane. Um, then you have a higher probability of being able to protect that data uh, and then recover from that in the event of an attack. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that that immutable backup to me seems really really important, and our federal agencies and DoD can utilize that today with FSXN, right? Yeah. So uh, the backup uh, system is built in, 
Um, it supports AWS backup as well as uh, backup partners that you're probably using uh, in your data centers today. Perfect, perfect. Um, we were on the topic, Michael, of uh, how do AWS and NetApp help? And, and Sean gave us a bunch there and we touched security. Any other thoughts around that question about at a high level, how do AWS and NetApp help? Well, in addition, I think we've touched really well on if they're, if the customer's using NetApp today, there's Snap Mirror, we touched on VMware, that can also be used if, if the workload is not on NetApp today, you can leverage VMware uh, with VMC to the cloud, that's an option, as well as some other tools like uh, I've seen worked with several customers who have tested and used Cloud Insights uh, by NetApp to identify what is that heterogeneous workload that is not on NetApp to identify what is the, uh, the capacity, the IOPS requirement, what's going to be needed from a, a network capacity, and then being able to spec in how does FSXN fit into that and then work through that process. So I do like to highlight that um, it's a, a fairly easy path to go from NetApp to FSXN or CVO, you can also mm -hmm. do that if you have a workload that is not sitting on, on NetApp today. Excellent. No, that's a great point. Um, and that touched on the next question. I think we might have covered some of it, but many of the DoD customers today already are using NetApp on on site. I know there are hundreds and hundreds of agencies and, and NetApp actually has tens of thousands of systems installed across the federal government. Um, so I think what I hear you guys saying is that due to things like Snap Mirror and the consistency of the functions of data on tap in, in cloud with FSXN or CVO, they can, any of, the, any of these agencies could easily replicate up and leverage all the best of services and functionality in the cloud as well as on-prem, right? Yeah, I, I think that's an important point. Um, what most customers may not be aware of um, is, you know, AWS has a, a range of, of, of partners, um, but not all of them spend uh, as much time and money in making sure that their cloud integrations uh, are as good um, as their, their data center based product. Um, and so one thing I've, I've been really happy to work with, with NetApp on is uh, ensuring that the the quality of the product and integrations that are supported on AWS um, are as consistent as possible uh, with their data center and even with um, other places that you can host uh, on tap. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so so that was touching on the value if a customer happens to have NetApp. Let's say they don't have NetApp on on premise. Um, how? What benefits do we have with FSXN or CVO, and and how why, might we help them, you know, get to cloud and and recognize some of the benefits of of this solution? I think that's where we can touch on and you know dive deeper into what is the workload. As I said earlier, with Cloud Insights, uh, going in and potentially if they're using VMware, using VMware's uh, native replication tool. Uh, I believe it's a HCX to be able to go into FSXN as the target. Um, those are a couple of options right there. Um, keep in mind that FSXN is an enterprise class storage. It's multi-protocol, so and it, which helps future-proof for government agencies. Mm. So you may start with the looking at it and saying, "Hey, I've got an SMB NFS." file shares that I want to be able to put into the cloud and six months to a year later, look at something to do with iSCSI or block with a different mm -hmm. workload. And so I think you get familiarity with it and there's a comfort level. So if you're, you're using NetApp today, it's on tap on-prem, it's on tap in the cloud. If you're not using NetApp today, it, you will learn, see that on tap has a lot of the same features and functionality that you're using on on-prem, carrying it up into the cloud. And there's some additional tools. So I think this is where we can get engaged with NetApp and AWS together and identify what is that workload if it's not sitting on, on NetApp today. And there are some different tools that can be leveraged to migrate that data to FSXN or CBO, depending on what's the best path for the customer. Yeah, so I think one of the, the keys is when, you know, a customer is already using a non-NetApp storage solution, um, when you go to migrate that, your initial concern is, am I going to break something? Is there going to be a compatibility issue? 
Um, and from what I've seen in the field, that that really hasn't been an issue. Uh, NetApp's ability to support multi-protocol, uh, specifically NFS, SMB, and iSCSI, um, has generally allowed them to migrate uh, diverse workloads onto uh, the NetApp platform and kind of maintain no real changes uh, with those applications. So it becomes a transparent change to the application, and then all the work is really done on the back end, and then they provide a few additional tools that make that a little easier. Outstanding. Um, that That's great. So even if customers are using NetApp, they're in, in good shape to, to be able to take advantage. And if they're not, there, there's choices out there uh, from AWS to help and, and NetApp to help assess what they have and then intelligently migrate, um, put it in the cloud, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, you know, the, the, it's crazy times we live in with all of these cyber and ransomware attacks. I know we talked about security and we, we mentioned a few things, but I wanted to touch on that cyber attack point of view and, and maybe just kind of summarize the highlights there. Um, how do we think that DOD customers can improve uh, their security posture uh, or their risk by using FSXN, for example, or, or CVO with AWS? Um, so depending on how you're you're deploying, one one of the things that I mentioned earlier was when you're in kind of this uh, hybrid situation where you're running, uh, you know, on-prem storage today uh, through let's say a, a NetApp hardware appliance, um, getting that extra copy into cloud and getting that separation of uh, the control plane is is giving that giving you that added layer of security and a place for which you can recover uh, that data. Right. In addition to that, there are more, um, you know, product direct features that help make that uh, easier to do. So whether you're talking about, um, you know, efficient snapshots that you can continually do, make it easy to version back to uh, files that uh, weren't corrupted, uh, whether it's that anomaly detection that I mentioned where you're actually um, finding other ways to determine that, that something unusual has occurred, whether it was an access pattern um, within the storage or whether it's um, something uh, within the network uh, connecting out to someplace it shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> you know, these are things that uh, are kind of kind of basic, but, um, you know, if you're trying to do all of this yourself, it's it's much harder. If you can use a managed service, if you can kind of deploy that with infrastructure as code, um, and if you can uh, scale that across a large number of teams in a very short amount of time, uh, then that's really where you're getting those those gains in, in efficiency and security very quickly. Outstanding. Um, Michael, what are you seeing out there on the cyber attack realm? Any, anything additional um, that, that we should touch on as far as helping DOD and other feds? The, what I'm, you know, it, it's a comfort level it, when people start talking about moving data into the cloud and knowing that it's going to be protected. And I think when you co combine AWS and NetApp together, there's a lot of the in, built in tools from both companies that will help with that process and identify where it should go and what level of security it could be in, depending on if you want to pick US commercial, GovCloud could go into one of our secret top secret regions, depending on the use case. So I think it's really diving in and understanding what is that workload and data set and the level of security that's needed to protect it. And having those conversations in depth help because there, <clears throat> we have, there are so many tools built into both, both companies to be able to provide peace of mind. Excellent, excellent. Well, gentlemen, this has been some fantastic content today. I'd, I'd like to kind of wrap up our session here and uh, just make one more pass to kind of summarize any top of thoughts that, you know, top of mind recommendations that you all might have, both of you for, you know, how can we help the federal government and DOD customers uh, do the best they can with FSXN and or, or CVO? So, um, Sean, I'll start with you if you want to give us your summary thoughts at a high level that'd be great thank you yeah um you know so i would start with saying is you know identify your key use cases and goals today um and work with teams that can help you uh, optimize that in a in a cloud or hybrid uh, environment so um 
a lot of the use cases, like I said, we see in um, a DoD case is uh, some subset of what we see, you know, globally across other customer bases. So there's a lot of experience already there in in optimizing these scenarios. Um, but it helps if if you can provide enough information that we can help you um, set that up in the best way possible. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. And Michael, any any summary thoughts for you around our discussion today? Uh, I think it, it's it, expanding on what Sean said and looking at the use case, it's collaboration between, you know, a minimum of three organizations. So the DOD agency, NetApp and AWS to really dive in and understand and have honest conversations about what is important as far as that data comes from and how it should be protected and where it should reside within uh, AWS for optimal performance and for security. And you, the only way we get there is by having conversations. And I think a lot of times we try to read a briefing doc and say yay or nay, mm -hmm. and you, we miss the, the opportunity of what's not written there. And I think that's something that we, I highly encourage. I see a lot of success in adoption of FSXN or even CVO when all the parties come together and have the conversation and go through the process of which one, which way to go is best for them. Because each customer is unique and different. There is no blueprint that says everybody is the same. And so we have to understand how to, you know, meet each customer's requirements. And you do that by having good conversations. Outstanding. Uh, Michael Chrissy and Sean Pufanich, thank you so much from AWS side. Thank you. Uh, this is Jim Cosby, CTO for Public Sector, covering partners and federal civilian. I thank everyone that attended today, and I'm going to now pass it back over to maybe Megan if we have any questions uh, from the audience or, or any of our attendees. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. Um, if anyone on the call, you know, has questions for Jim, Sean, or Michael that they want to ask, you know, before we end, feel free to put those into the chat. You know, in the meantime, I want to thank all three of you for con contributing to the conversation today and providing um, such helpful and and great insight um, to those customers that we have on this call. Uh, and just a reminder, we will be sending a short feedback form to all of you uh, later today, um, along with a copy of the recording from the session, um, but we would appreciate any feedback you have related to this session and what you heard. And you know, finally, if you feel your organization would benefit from a deeper, more customized dive on this topic, we're happy to help make that happen. So feel free to reach out to your local NetApp or AWS resource, and, and we are happy to coordinate and, and try and make that happen for you. So I haven't seen any questions from the chat come in, Jim, but we can probably hang on another couple minutes or two um, just in case there's anyone that, that has any questions. But with that, I just want to thank everyone that joined today and hope that this session was valuable to you and your organization. Thank you, Megan, and thank you everyone for attending. Please let us know if you have a question, yeah. but thank you very much.